everyone. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Ashley Griffin, a Broadway performer, writer, and theater journalist. This is my co-host, Poppy. If you're new here, welcome. Don't forget to click the subscribe button for more content from your theatrical Hermione Granger. So let's jump in. In 2003, a musical opened on Broadway that did what no successful commercial musical before it had ever done. Centered on something more experimental than dancing, singing cats. In a larger-than-life junkyard, they appear. They slink and crawl and sing. And suddenly, from every corner of the stage and right through the roof of the Winter Garden Theater, the lights begin to flash, the music begins to swell, and the stage begins to soar with cats. More spectacular than a flying helicopter. <laughs> and riskier than titling a musical Urinetown. Nothing can kill a show like too much exposition. How about bad subject matter? Well. Or a bad title even, that could kill a show pretty good. This musical was centered around two female leads. I kid you not, this literally blew people's mind. Up until this point, the most noteworthy show to center around two women was Sideshow, the brilliant but not ultimately successful and not known to many people outside of the Broadway community, show about real-life conjoined sisters Violet and Daisy Hilton and their struggle to fulfill their personal dreams and find romance. Most Broadway shows followed the however well-disguised, formula of the leading lady and the comic secondary female role. Think Lori and Ado Annie in Oklahoma, or even Millie and Miss Dorothy in Thoroughly Modern Millie, though in that show both get a fair shake at the comedy, if there are even two female leads in a show at all. Now, quick disclaimer, this is not meant to become a discussion about every show on Broadway that has ever had two women that are important to the story. There's lots of them. There's Chicago, there's Wonderful Town, there's Gypsy. But none of those stories were focused on and marketed as centrally a show about the relationship between two women. And there's lots of other little things I can get into that differentiated those shows from Wicked. Wonderful Town, I might argue, might fall into the category of leading lady and secondary female lead in a slightly different way. Gypsy is particularly centered on Mama Rose. Louise doesn't even become a main character in the story until the second half, and the story is focused on Rose's unparalleled show motherliness and trying to get fame and attention. Chicago has a, a whole wide ensemble cast that are all pretty relatively equal to each other. But again, this isn't meant to get into the semantics of that. Certainly there have been other shows with two women, but Wicked was different. It caused a riotous sensation. It was deliberately focused centrally on the relationship between the two women. And that's what the marketing focused on. And seriously, even with other shows having gone before, people did not know what to make of Wicked. And they kind of freaked out about it. Like, they thought it was the most revolutionary thing that had ever happened. Go check out the press from the time. All right, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Just let's focus on everything that comes after, not the semantics of how many women were in any given Broadway show. Because <laughs> the point is coming. <laughs> but Sideshow, to get back to that, was a slightly under-the-radar obscure bio-musical. Wicked was, at the time it opened, one of the most expensive musicals ever produced, created by an all-star team led by Broadway superstar Stephen Schwartz in his return to Broadway after a decades-long absence, funded partially by a Hollywood film studio, and based on two of the biggest cultural juggernauts in history, The Wizard of Oz and Gregory Maguire's Ozian riff, Wicked, which all but created a new genre of storytelling, retelling a well-known classic from the villain's point of view. Focusing the musical on the friendship between Elphaba, Maguire's name for the Wicked Witch of the West, and Glinda, 
was not a foregone conclusion. Both characters obviously appear in the novel, most notably as reluctant roommates in college, but the story is most definitely Elphaba's. Glinda is on the sidelines or completely absent for much of the tale, but two things happened at the musical's inception that set the wheels in motion for a refocusing of the story. The first was Schwartz bringing Winnie Holtzman on board as the book writer, at the time, Holtzman was most well known as the creator of the TV series My So-Called Life, starring Claire Danes. Schwartz liked how she handled the female characters and a female-centered story, and thought she would be a perfect fit for Wicked. The second is that Schwartz wanted to write the role of Glinda for Kristen Chenoweth, a perfect match of character and performer if there ever was one. <laughs> When development started on Wicked, Chenoweth had recently won a Tony Award for You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, which made her an overnight sensation. I like it! but she hadn't yet had a Broadway starring role, let alone something tailored for her. With her brilliant comic timing, dramatic chops, stunning voice, and beautiful blonde petite looks, she was the only choice for the role, and Chenoweth signed up immediately. In fact, no one else had ever played the role of Glinda, other than an occasional understudy, between the musical's inception and Chenoweth leaving the Broadway production. This meant that the role of Glinda was going to need to be built up, it took a while to figure out, but the creators clearly wanted to keep giving Chenoweth more to work with. In fact, Chenoweth's unique abilities even determined Glinda's vocal sound in the show. Chenoweth wanted to feature both her operatic soprano and her Broadway belt, inspiring Schwartz to write Glinda's vocals as lyric soprano when she's in public, think No One Mourns the Wicked, and thank goodness. Fellow Ozians, let us speak mad, let us speak rageful. And a belt when she's in private. Think popular. I know about popular, and with an assist from me to be who you'll be, instead of dreary who you were, well, are. There's nothing that can stop you from becoming popular. Lar. La. Yeah. La, la. We're gonna make you pop. As the musical continued to develop, the primary challenge for the creative team was paring down McGuire's novel into a concise two-act musical. The Wicked novel goes off in a lot of directions, from Elphaba's complex underground political affiliations, to the religious history of Munchkinland, to animal rights, and more. But as the musical progressed, it became apparent that it really came alive whenever Elphaba and Glinda were interacting. The show became about their friendship and how these two very different women change each other for good. The characters are completely divergent, and even the actresses that originated the roles, Adina Menzel and Kristen Chenoweth, said that they themselves were diametric opposites in just about every way, from their personalities, to their looks, to how they approached their work in the rehearsal room. When Wicked opened, it became a cultural phenomenon, especially with young women. As with most things that girls and women enjoy, it was ridiculed. I was personally deeply affected when I saw Wicked for the first time, and I remember arriving at NYU for college and being absolutely teased for liking the show. After all, this was spectacle. 
and spectacle was killing theater, right? Side note, the staging of the Broadway adaptation of The Little Mermaid was specifically announced to not be spectacle-driven in response to this criticism, and then it got skewered for not being spectacle enough. There were many reasons for Wicked's success, specifically with this demographic, but a large part of it was the female characters at the center of the show. Glinda is beautiful, popular, and wealthy. She is charming, funny, ambitious, and actually quite smart, more in a political way than a book smart way. We first meet her in a scene reminiscent of Ding Dong the Witch is Dead, in which she tells the munchkins that the Wicked Witch of the West has just died. She is lovely, loved, and very nice. You're so nice. You're not good, you're not bad, you're just nice. But when she starts getting grilled by the munchkins about her relationship with the witch, we start to see cracks in her facade. She somewhat, we learn later why not fully, owns her friendship with Alphaba, and indeed the entire story that follows is her remembering her and Alphaba's relationship. We see Glinda, or Galinda at this point, arrive at Shiz University. She's instantly the person everyone wants to hang out with. She's confident, self-assured, and good. This is not a Regina George we're dealing with. She might be a little out of touch, but when she says that she has a private suite, then quickly adds, but you can all visit me whenever you want, she is sincere. She is honestly trying to be nice and inclusive, but because she loves the adoration this sends her way. She is also focused and determined. Her singular goal in attending Shiz is to be part of Madame Morrible's elite sorcery seminar, which she, shockingly to her, is not accepted into. She meets Alphaba, and they are like oil and water. But Glinda, after attempting to undermine Alphaba, ultimately comes to care for her and begins to realize some of her own shortcomings. Throughout the show, Glinda follows her ambitions to the point of compromising her morals. But when she ultimately gets everything she thinks she wants, she realizes that her life has been built on a selfish, shallow foundation, and she does what few characters of her type do, sets out to make it right, no matter the cost. When Alphaba sings to her at the end, and just look at you, you can do all I couldn't do. It's a statement of the fact that Glinda's sincere social skills and, well, niceness give her the ability to institute change in a way Alphaba, with her brashness, blunt honesty, and single-minded focus, couldn't. Glinda goes from being superficially good to being truly good during the course of the show. Alphaba, on the other hand, is strong-willed, fiercely intelligent, and intensely vulnerable with a defensive facade. Her identity has been built on being different, unwanted, and unloved. But she is idealistic, imaginative, and kind. I like to think of her character as, if she had been born in Kansas with non-green skin, she would have been Dorothy. Alphaba arrives at Shiz the diametric opposite of Glinda. She is not loved, she is not popular. She never seeks the spotlight, but is constantly the source of unwanted attention. As she says, I don't cause commotions, I am one. But she quickly discovers that she is powerful in a way that makes her special. Whereas Madame Morrible instantly shuts down Glinda's attempts to study sorcery with her, practically the instant Madame Morrible meets Alphaba, she announces that not only will Alphaba be admitted into the sorcery program, but that Morrible will take no other students. Ultimately, unlike Glinda, Alphaba's morals win out over her desire for love and acceptance, and she is publicly branded as evil for doing what is right. Alphaba's journey is one of self-acceptance and love. By the end of the show, she has embraced her power and uniqueness, while also opening herself up to love from others, all while coming to understand and embrace her flaws. Many women saw themselves in Alphaba and Glinda, and this was especially meaningful as too often women, and other marginalized groups, must relate to a character not overtly representative of themselves when consuming media. There's nothing inherently wrong with this. We should all be able to empathize with and relate to characters that are different from us, but it becomes a problem when you never see yourself in a story. I'm not saying that every story must have a token character from every marginalized group, but I am saying that every marginalized group 
deserves to have their stories told. This isn't a case of token gender swapping. This is about everyone being able to see stories that holistically relate to their unique experience. Elphaba and Glinda aren't characters whose stories would be the same if you swapped in two guys. Being women is innate to their journeys and experiences. It's complicated to get into the specifics without entering into a discussion of gender identity, which is a complex conversation, but, well, I'll speak from my own experience. I appreciate that Elphaba's power was not just an appropriation of stereotypical signifiers of masculine power. She doesn't have a sword in her hand. She's not physically fighting anyone. The closest she comes is in a comic moment when Elphaba and Glinda for the briefest instant fight each other with broom and wand respectively. Her emotional life is a central aspect of who she is, and her power is tied to her emotions and intellect. For both Elphaba and Glinda, the way they physically appear and move through the world is central to their arcs and personal battles. Glinda's looks are so important to her because... Like for most women, it is often our currency in a patriarchal world. Likewise, Elphaba's otherness is tied to her appearance. This is something women deal with in a unique way. There was a line floating around after Wicked's opening, there's a green girl inside us all. I know that certainly resonated with me. The idea that what others deem wrong about you is plastered on your face, and if you could only get the wizard to de-greenify you, you would belong. The challenges the characters must overcome are primarily psychological. The way that Glinda undermines Elphaba when all the students go to a party at the Ozdust Ballroom is something most women will recognize on a personal level. I remember feeling a visceral gut punch watching Glinda manipulate Elphaba into believing Glinda wants to be her friend, capped with a gesture that worms its way into the deepest part of Elphaba's vulnerability. Glinda gives Elphaba a hat to wear that she sells as being the coolest. And Glinda would know. Glinda is the coolest, best dresser in all of Oz. Probably for the first time in Elphaba's life, a woman in a position of power is treating her kindly, offering her a hand and helping her be accepted in and navigate her way through the world of womanhood, a world that has completely excluded Elphaba all her life. Elphaba is in fact so touched by Glinda's gesture that she puts her own future and dreams, the one she sang an entire I Want song about in The Wizard and I, in jeopardy, telling Madame Morrible that she will quit the sorcery seminar, giving up all hope of meeting the wizard, unless Glinda is included too. When she then shows up at the Ozdust Ballroom proudly wearing the hat, making probably her first attempt ever to be a part of the group because she believes she will now be welcome, she is immediately ridiculed by everyone present. It turns out Glinda gave Elphaba the ugliest hat in all of Oz to wear, then set her up for public humiliation. For most women, that hits close to home. There's an old adage, guys will take you out back and settle a dispute with a fight and then it'll all be over and done. Girls will make you think they're your best friend, then give you an eating disorder. It's harsh. It's awful. Isn't it, Poppy? It's not good. It's harsh and stereotypical, but there is a kernel of truth to it. It's also especially moving that Elphaba continues to wear the hat throughout the rest of the show, it even becoming a brand recognition of her evilness. She wears the hat knowing that it's the ugliest hat in all of Oz because it reminds her of what becomes a sincere friendship with Glinda. But even more of a shock, Elphaba and Glinda aren't the only fleshed out female characters in this story. Let's not forget Elphaba's sister, Nessa Rose, who, though a secondary lead, gives us yet a third female perspective. This one in between Elphaba and Glinda's. Nessa Rose is beautiful. She's nice. She's loved by her family and is being groomed to become the next leader of Munchkinland, usurping her sister's position in the line of succession. But she has a disability. She's a wheelchair user, which sets her apart. She's not ostracized like her sister, no green skin, but she feels she can never belong like Glinda. Nessa Rose has an opposite arc from both Glinda and Elphaba. She goes from being a sweet person to someone who is literally willing to do anything and bend any moral code in order to get what she wants. She is so desperate to keep the first boy who shows her any sign of affection, even though she knows it's not real, that she quite literally changes the laws of her country to all but enslave him and his entire race. Then when he protests, 
She tries to forcibly use magic she knows she doesn't understand or have control over to make him love her, almost killing him in the process and ultimately causing him to be turned into a mechanical man with no heart. She then deflects the blame onto Elphaba. There is Madame Morrible, the at least in the first act and arguably for most of the show, most powerful person in Oz. She's the one pulling the strings and controlling all the events, the only one who knows the truth about the wizard, and is the bridge between the wizard's political power and the actual magical power of Oz. Seemingly a positive female mentor for Elphaba, she is ultimately a, if not the, villain of the piece, and uses her power to bring down Elphaba and emotionally manipulate Glinda. And then, over all the proceedings, there is the shadow of Dorothy and the added complexity to her character in the minds of the audience, knowing how people and forces outside of her knowledge are manipulating her and the events she experiences. In this world, Dorothy is an innocent bystander, a child being used as a pawn in the political machinations of Oz. Dorothy is such an important character in our collective consciousness that I would argue that though she literally only appears as a shadow in the musical and is only spoken to by the principal characters, she functions almost as a tertiary lead in our minds as we watch the show. There is a romance intermixed with Elphaba and Glinda's story, but it has much more of an impact on Elphaba's personal journey than it does to the plot or to the relationship between Elphaba and Glinda. It is the reason Glinda suggests the wizard and Morrible go after Nessa Rose to get at Elphaba, and there is resentment in the second act when Fiero chooses Elphaba over Glinda. But Wicked is not the story of a love triangle. In fact, when the show first opened, Norbert Leo Butts, the original Fierro, said in an interview that he quickly had to adjust to the fact that for the first time in his experience, he, as the leading man, was primarily there to serve the story of others, rather than have his story be the central focus, a situation women are all too familiar with. All of this is especially important when you look at the strong brood of feminism in the original Oz stories and how that, unlike in Wicked, has often been undermined in retellings. L. Frank Baum, the author of most of the original Oz tales, that's a whole other story, was an avowed feminist, as was his wife and mother-in-law, who was instrumental in the suffragette movement. Oz is a matriarchal society, and with the exception of the wizard arriving and taking over, we learn just how manipulatively and at the expense of women it was in later books, and the temporary interim rule of the Scarecrow, namely in the marvelous land of Oz before being ousted in a coup led by General Ginger, and ultimately, happily, replaced by Ozma, the rightful ruler of Oz, is run and ruled by women. The witches of Oz, both good and bad, who rule their respective quadrants, are women. The rightful ruler of Oz, who is brought back to the throne after the wizard's departure, is a woman. Many powerful secondary characters in the Oz books, from General Ginger, the leader of an army of revolt who briefly rules the Emerald City, to Polychrome, the daughter of the Rainbow King and alleged heir apparent to the Rainbow Kingdom, and many, many more are women. You would never know it to look at some of the most recent retellings. I'll pull out Oz the Great and Powerful as a perfect example. Any matriarchy or feminism in Oz is gone. Oz the Great and Powerful has abandoned all of Baum's mythology and instead gives us a story about a poor, ununited kingdom, Oz, waiting for the literal chosen one to come and rule them and bring peace. All of the women in this world are either completely inept, superficial, or downright evil. The central conflict of the story involves the future wizard's relationship with one of the powerful women of Oz, who, when she realizes her love is unrequited, drinks a potion to get rid of her heart, turns evil, and attempts to enslave Oz, all in retribution for being a woman scorned. Do you think she'll be his queen? Well, of course she'll be his queen. What did you expect? <gasps> Can't compete with Glinda's charms. No one can. Such is a broken heart. Your precious wizard did that to you. Make it stop. Would you like me to? One bite and your heart will become impenetrable. One bite and you and I will finally share the throne. Unless you'd rather see Oz and Glinda there. Just your heart withering away. Fear not, Theodora, for 
Soon you will feel nothing at all except beautiful wickedness. I can cast a simple enchantment and have you looking just the way you were before. No! This is who I am now! I want him to see me like this. I want him to know that he was the one who made me this way. <laughs> Glinda is partially good because she's the woman the wizard sets his sights on. Somehow the Oz story was turned into a tale of a bunch of beleaguered women needing a humbug charlatan of a man to come and love them and solve all their problems. Now, I for one don't think that stories involving women being saved or falling in love are inherently problematic by any means. But in the case of Oz the Great and Powerful, it absolutely is. In the years since Wicked, there have been other shows featuring multiple female leads. Apparently, Wicked doing so well means that it's okay now. War Paint, for all its faults, comes to mind as a story with two interesting women at the center, as does Grey Gardens. Six gets the female-driven narrative beautifully right by telling six unique and complex female stories in equal degree, deliberately taking back the power for the silenced voices of what has historically been a story inappropriately focused on the man in their collective lives. I hope that this is a trend that will continue, and not just because it's politically correct, but because these are stories and characters we need. I remember seeing Wicked for the first time and getting to about the middle of The Wizard and I. Now, I've been a diehard theater girl since I could talk, and yet this was the first time I looked at a stage and suddenly felt, oh my God, that's me. That character is 100% expressing my feelings and my experience. It sounds sappy, but it was life-changing. It was a real-life ugly duckling moment, and I then proceeded to be mocked for years for having that experience. What was done with Wicked's female characters was remarkable, but the fact that it was so remarkable in 2003 is troubling. And the fact that there was such an insidious fallout from it is more troubling still. I wonder who most men relate to in Wicked. Is it Fiero or the wizard or Bach? Possibly. They're great characters and very relatable. Is it because they're the male characters that they identify with them? I hope not. But I bet more than a few men identify with Elphaba, just as I relate to Frodo in The Lord of the Rings because his journey, more than any other character in the story, most closely resonates with me. Representation matters, not just for those who need their stories told and have long been excluded from the narrative, but so that we can all learn to see ourselves in those different from ourselves. We need to take a closer look at how subversive, in many ways, wicked, and the Oz stories in general were and continue to be. Wicked and Oz have certainly personally changed me for good.